Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. Welcome to today's STEM Boom Camp. We'll be going over the basics of programming in Python, and I'll try to make it as easy as possible for everyone to understand. So, who are we? STEM Pump is a student-led initiative that teaches students the best of STEM technologies for free. We cover everything from programming to robotics, even game design. So how does this camp work? During the stream, we encourage you to follow along with the links we give you and type out the code that we do too. Feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll get around to answering them. If you have any questions after the camp, feel free to reach out to us. So today's camp, these are the topics we'll be covering. First, we'll talk about what the basic concept of programming is. Then I'll move on to syntax, which is a very essential concept. After that, we'll go to the basic um, uh, ideas behind programming, which include variables and data types, math and programming, functions, and control flow logic. We'll do a couple of mini projects along the way to make sure everyone understands what's going on. And at the end of the camp, we'll cover some applications of Python, which is really where the interesting stuff is, the most interesting stuff. So what is programming? Let's answer the burning question. Well, programming is basically us writing down instructions that we want a computer to do. Now this computer I'm talking about could be anything with a chip in it, essentially. Um, it could be the laptop or PC you're using to watch this stream. It could be an iPad, smartphone, anything. It could even be a little Raspberry Pi, if you know what that is. Another interesting thing is you can also use, you can also program robots. Um, and when I say program robots, I really mean you're giving instructions to the brain of the robot, which then executes those instructions to make the robot do whatever you want it to do. Now let's talk about programming languages. Remember those, inst remember those instructions I was talking about? Well, a computer can't just understand plain English. Although that's becoming more common with like AI and natural language processing and whatnot, but that's not what we're covering today. If you wanna learn about that, you can take the camp in July. Um, and to solve this problem, people came up with languages that both we humans and computers can understand. It's a genius of a creation, because now we can tell computers what to do. We can understand these languages because they're similar to English. At the same time, the computers can understand them because each command we write down is converted straight to machine language, telling the machine what to do. Examples of programming languages you've probably heard of before include Java, Python, C++, and Swift. Today we'll be talking about Python specifically. So, you know how English has a set of rules that we have to follow so that other people can understand what we're talking about? It's called grammar. Similarly, programming languages have a, have a concept called syntax, which is basically the set of rules that you have to follow when writing code in order to make sure the computer running the code understands what you're saying. Um, basically what I'm trying to get at here is when you hear me say the word syntax, know that this is just what programmers use for the rules we need to follow in writing, AKA grammar. Any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna need all of you to pull up this link and and maybe pull it up side by side to, or like side aside side by side to the stream because we're gonna need to be we're gonna need to do type out code so you'll want to be able to watch the stream and type this code out simultaneously. So yeah, stempump.com slash r slash editor. So for today's class, we'll work in an online code editor. In real life, when programming on projects, you'll want to download Python from the Python website and then download a good IDE to write code in. Um, IDEs make coding faster with suggestions, corrections, etc., and it's normally a desktop app that you can get on your computer. We're, ba we're essentially using an online IDE, so let's try to understand how that works right now. Um, you should see something like this. If you want, we can push this to the left so that it doesn't bother us. Um, 
basically this white space on the left is where you write out your code. Whereas on the, and then if you click run, that code will be, will be executed. Any output you have to show will show up on the right side in this black space, which is also sometimes called the console. So yeah, if you hear me say console, that's what I mean. So now let's go into the first um, item on the agenda today, which is variables and data types. So what are variables? Think of them as containers in your program, essentially. They each contain a value. Like here, you can put values in, you can take values out. You give containers a value or, or variables a value when you make them. And you can change or vary that value anytime in the code. Because you can vary it, you have the name variable. So what are data types? It's in the name, isn't it? Data types are basically the type of a certain value used in your program. Variables always hold values, right? Those values can be of a certain data type. All information or data used in a program has to be categorized as a certain type in order to make sure the computer running the code understands the information. Lucky for us, Python does that automatically. Let's go over the main data types in Python. First, there's the integer, represented by int in Python. This is any number without a decimal, positive or negative. Then we have the float, represented by float in Python. <laughs> it's basically any number, positive or negative, but it can also hold decimals. Um, Aside from numbers, you can also hold text because I mean programming, right? It can't just be numbers. You can also hold text and these are text-based data types. This is normally called the string and it's represented by str in Python. In programming languages, including Python, you always put text in between quotes. This text inside the quotes is called a string. And if you want to create multiple strings, you write out multiple sets of text surrounded by different sets of quotes. We'll go over some examples soon. Um, let's create some containers or variables in Python. We'll go, let's go to the, com the editor compiler. Let's start off with variable syntax. So to create a variable, we must first come up with a name. I'll name this my container because I told you variables are kind of like containers. And you can't have any spaces in the name. Therefore, I put an underscore to represent a space. You can choose whatever you like. Then I put an equal sign. This is some this is called the assignment operator. You know, it's not that important to know. We'll go over the differences soon. But um, basically, what you put to the right of the equal sign is the value of this, the initial value you give this container. So let's give this initial value. Or sorry, let's give this container an initial value of um, a string, I guess, some text. And we'll have it say, hello world. Typically, when you write your first program, you write out hello world and print it to the console in any programming language. So since this is probably your first time working with Python, let's do that. So uh, I'm going to write print. You don't need to know what the print means right now. I'll go over it in more detail later. Just know that uh, this is based, this line I'm about to write prints out the value of the variable to the console. So I'm going to write this out and click run, top, top green button, and then it says hello world. So there you go. That's your first program of the day. If I was to remove the print statement, nothing would show up. We'd just we'd just be giving a value to a variable and nothing else. So the print statement is essential. Let's also create some other types of variables now. Let's do a variable for some random price. I guess we'll make it 699, because why not? Um, and let's print out the type of this variable. Again, I'll explain what these other words like print and type are doing later. For now, just know that this prints out the type of the variable. So now when I hit run, you have hello world coming from the previous print statement. And from this print statement, we have the float. That's because this is indeed a float. It's a number with decimals. So we base it telling us that we printed out a float. 
let's also make another variable. I'm not very creative. Let's just do my number and set it equal to 54. Now, what do you think this, the type of this variable is? Because data types, right? So we have strings, floats, and integers. Well, it says integer. And that's right, because there's no decimals here. So Python automatically assigns it to the integer um, type, data type. When you actually write real programs, you'll use the values of these variables throughout your code. You might even change the value of the variable at times. Some other times you might choose not to even change the value of the variable, but you just use the variable because you want your code to be clearer because we're able to describe what the value means here. Like we say price, okay, something's price is 699. Although these aren't really descriptive, but normally your variable names should be descriptive. Any questions? Yeah, sure, I can slow down. So the second program, or this the second um, thing we're building, we're writing out a price variable is basically me creating a number six six point nine nine, and setting it equal to price, which is a variable I just made. All right, I named it price. I set a value of six point nine nine, and since six point nine nine is a decimal number, it's of the float data type. Remember when we were going over the three data types earlier? There's integer, float, and string. So yeah, this is a float data type. And so when I print out the type of it, it prints out float. I told, like I said earlier, we'll go over what type and print and these parentheses all do later. Just if you want to see how this works, just copy it out um, word or letter for letter. Any other questions? All right, so let's move on to math in Python. So in Python, now that we've covered variables, let's move on to how we do math with these variables in a program. Basically, we can use the computer to run basic arithmetic and math um, like a calculator. It computes the answers to any math problems we do if you write it with the correct syntax. Let's look at the... Um, signs that we use to do different mathematical operations. First of all, you have the plus sign. I mean, that's pretty obvious, right? Plus for addition, minus for subtraction. And then some of you might have already known about the star, which is used for multiplication. And then the slash, which is used for division. So yeah, let's actually use so let's do some math here with some variables. So let's create, let's start from scratch again, make another variable. Again, I'm not being very creative with the names. We'll become more creative when we get to some projects. So I'm gonna make a first, a variable named first number and set it equal to five, which is an integer. Then I'd make it, I'd, I'd name another variable called second number and set it equal to eight. So now we have two variables holding two initial values. One is five and the other is eight. So if I wanted to compute the sum, which is adding the two variables together, I could set the sum equal to another variable. So I could do total equals first number plus second number. And what that does is adds five plus eight. So what do you think that would be? I'm going to run this code right now and you'll see that nothing shows up. That's because I didn't write out the print. So what we're going to have to do is write out print and then the variable name. So this will print out the value of the variable. Again, I'll go into more detail about what the print does later, but for now, 
just know that I'm about to print out the value of total, and it's 13, because 5 plus 8 is indeed 13. Of course, there are more there are more mathematical operators that can be used in Python. You can learn more about them on our website, on the resources page on our website for stem for um, Python. Here we added variables together, and we use the values of the variables to to get the value of the new variable. So we we this is basically five, right? We're using the name of the variable to reference the number. So see how this is basically describing. So it, it makes the program clearer. Although it's not as clear, it'll become way clearer if in a project that we're about to do. So we'll get to that soon. But for now, just keep this in mind. All right. So if anyone have any questions, if not, we can move on to talk about the print. Okay, cool. Let's go to print. So the print um, parentheses is basically a statement that we can use in our code. Um, this We will be using this statement to make numbers, text, variable values, etc. appear on the screen. Like I said earlier, in Python, to make information show up on the console, you have to use this statement. To do this, you have to follow correct syntax, of course. And if you do so, you'll be able to make, like like I said, text, numbers, etc. pop up. Even a combination of the three is possible. Basically, you start with print, followed by a pair of parentheses. Notice there's no space between the print and the parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we put in the value that we want to be printed to the console, or showed on the console. This could be integer, string, float, anything you like. You can even do a combination of the three, but we'll get to that soon. Um, so if you see here, you can also print out variable values. If you create a variable, set it to a certain value, and then you access that variable's value here by typing out the variable name and printing, it'll print out the variable's value. Notice how we're, we're referencing the variable using its name. This is what we did earlier with the total and all the other examples we were doing where we were printing stuff. So now, if you want, you can try these out, but let's move on to the concatenation concept. So in Python, we can use the plus sign for numbers, yes, of course, to add them together. We can also use them to put words and text together, too. This is called concatenation. Don't worry about the name. Just, just know that you can use the plus sign to bring strings together um, into a bit, one big string. For example, we can put these three strings together, which is hello, and then a space, and then a world. If you use these plus signs, it just puts all of these characters together. So H-E-L-L-O space W-O-R-L-D exclamation. All of that is put together into one string here, which if you print out, shows up as this really nice phrase, hello world. Again, like the one we did earlier. Let's work on a short program that prints out a greeting using this concept of concatenation. So let's create a variable name and you guys can set it to your names if you want. I'll use stem pump because why not? Um, and then let's concatenate or add strings together. I'm not gonna, we could use the technical term, but it's, un, it's not necessary. So we have sentence is another variable I'm, I'm making and I'm gonna set it equal to, so I'm, I'm, I'm naming the variable sentence and now I'm gonna set it equal to the concatenated form or the added up form of two strings. Hi there, comma, and then a space. And then I'm gonna add that to the name. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm actually just putting together two strings. It's just that I can change this name and the output would be different each time if I was to print. So now let's also um, print this variable. Like I said, this is printing out the value of the variable. 
so in this case, the name is stem pump. So you're going to put step stem pump comes here. So it'd be high there, comma, space, stem pump. That's what we should expect. If I was to run it, that's what shows up. The cool thing about using this variable, though, is that I can change this value for the name. And it would show up here, change too, because I don't need to change it everywhere. I just need to change it here. So I could name, I don't know, a car, dog, whatever you want. See, it says car. We could say Python, and it shows up. See, and it's really descriptive too, because we know. Okay, the the variable is called name, and the value is Python. And Python is a, is just the name of who we're addressing. So if I was addressing a guy named Aaron, it would say hi there, Aaron. And it, name is just Aaron, but it's really descriptive now because we know. Okay, Aaron is the guy's name. So we know that we're actually just messing with his name here. Um, all right, so one thing you must notice, though, is, is this is the tricky part about concatenation. The space, if you don't put it here, your text will look pretty ugly because like it's not going to be formatted properly. Let's see what that looks like. See this? There's no space there. It's like weird. The comma is touching the A. So you need to add the space to make it split up and have the normal spacing between words. All right, so hopefully you got that and we'll move on to keywords. One of the basic ideas behind programming is the keyword, especially in Python. Keywords are words in programming languages that have special meanings and are reserved for that purpose only. They give the computer information about the code it's getting. For example, we use the if keyword to tell the computer that the line of code that is being looked at is an if statement that has a condition being checked. Speaking of if statements, it's actually get onto if statements, like you see here. So the if keyword, when used, makes an if statement on that line of code. We use this if statement for decision making. If statements basically ask a true or false question. If the answer is true, then you perform a specific set of code. For example, if the chicken crossed the road, then congratulate it. So if the ch has the chicken crossed the road is like a question, true or false question. And if it's true, then we congratulate it. If it's false, that means it hasn't crossed. We don't do anything. Let's look at the syntax, though. So we have, we write the if keyword followed by the condition or question we are asking. Condition is a more, I mean, I guess it's a fancier word, but in reality, you can think of it as a question. We're just asking the computer a question, and then we put a colon after that, and we go to the next line. Most editors will automatically add a tab here if you go to the next line, but if it, if it doesn't, you wanna make sure to add a tab, because if we want, um, because Typically, it's just a single press of the tab key to make this indent. And then whatever code you write will run only if the, if, if, if the answer to the question is true. Note that we must make sure to indent, because if we don't, the computer running the code won't realize that this code should only run if the if statement, if the question is, is answered with a true. It'll run no matter what if we don't indent it. So just make sure to do that. Let's go to the compiler and work within some examples. So let's say, let's do basic stuff without variables for now. So if, and you write your you write your question out, six is less than nine. So but we're basically asking, is six less than nine? And if it is, then we'll print out six is less than nine. Right, so let's run that. Six is less than nine. And it says that because this is indeed true. The answer to this is six less than nine question is yes. So it'll run this code. Now, what if the answer was no? Let's try that. Is nine less than six? If so, print nine is less than six. If we run this, notice it doesn't show up. This is because 
9 is not less than 6. So the answer is no. So this code doesn't run. So it'll just go down to the next code that's on next bit of code that's on this line. And there is none, so the program's over. Now imagine that we, we accidentally did not indent and we wrote print 9 is less than 6 out here. What this is going to do is run this. So it'll first the code will first go, it'll run this if statement. This is true, so it'll run this. Now it'll go to this if statement. This is false, so it'll skip this. Then it'll go here. Notice how it's always staying on this column, like it's starting on this column. So it's going to run this, no, this, this line of code no matter what. And now when we run, it'll say 9 is less than 6, even though that's not true. That's why indentation is so important. Now let's move on to talk about comparison operators like the ones we used here and more advanced versions of them as well. Any questions? Oh yeah, make sure to put the colon in your syntax. If you don't, it, it doesn't register and you're gonna have some issue in your code, so do that right. Any questions? All right, so let's move on. Let's move on to the comparison operators. So let's, t let's take a look at the basic comparison operators like the ones used earlier. We'll be using these in if statements a lot. They mostly make sense. They sh um, these mo should mostly make sense to you from math classes except the equal and not equal to ones. I'll be honest with you, programming languages have some weird rules, but trust me, they have their reasons. The operator to check if two things are equal has two equal signs rather than one. A single equal sign, like I said earlier, is used to assign a value to a variable. So they had to come up with a different operator to check if two things were equal. And And since computers aren't smart enough to understand context like us humans, they sort of just had to come up with this double equal to sign. And then you have this not equal to. The not equal to has an exclamation followed by an equal sign. I guess this kind of makes more sense. Use the explanation, the exclamation mark and the equal sign to check if a value is not equal to another. The um, Equal and not equal to operators specifically can also be used for strings, not just numbers. Whereas these are usually only used with numbers. Um, because you can always check if two strings are the same. You can check, is house the same as house? Is house the same as car? No, but is house the same as house? Yes. And so on. So now let's work with these. Let's create a, another variable called name. This time, I guess we'll set it equal to something different, maybe Marie. And let's ask the quest. Let's ask a question, basically asking, are you Donald? So we'll say if name equals Donald. So this is asking, are you Donald? If yes, then it'll do whatever code we're about to write. So I'm going to say print hi Donald, because if it's Donald, you want to say hi to Donald, right? What if it's not Donald? Then we'll have to create another if statement and say, if it's not equal to Donald, then it'll just say, you're not Donald. I mean, cause like, right? That's what you'd say, I guess. You're not Donald. And so basically what we're doing here is we're checking to see if the name variable is the same, the value of the name variable is the same as the Donald. It's the same as Donald. And Marie is not the same as Donald, therefore, it'll not run this statement. But Marie and but here Marie is again not the same as Donald, but it's checking is it not equal to Donald? So if it isn't equal to Donald, the answer is yes, so it'll run this code. So let's see that in action. See, it says you're not Donald. Notice 
the, we used we compared strings here with these operators, not the usual numbers like we did earlier. Now let's move to a new data type called booleans that you probably um, aren't very familiar with. So let's get let's get to that. So remember how I said if statements ask true or false questions to the program. Well, in most programming languages, this true or false answer to the question is actually part of a data type, the Boolean. We can set variables to have a Boolean value. That is a true or false value. We also can check to see if variables have a true or false value in the in if statements. Let's try this in the editor. So I'm going to do some basic variable logic here. So a equals true. And then this is basically saying, okay, we have a variable named a, and I'm setting it equal to the Boolean value true, because it can, you can either have true or false. Know that T is capital and F is capital in true and false. Now let's check to see if a is true. We can type out, we can either type out if a equals true and ask, and this is basically asking, is a true? Or we can just write a without any of that other junk because in Python, there's a shortcut that allows for this in that you don't have to write it out if you're just wanting to check if the answer, if the value is true. Now I'll just print out a is true. run it, and it says A is true because A is indeed true. What if A was false, though? This one we're going to have to say if A is equal to false, print A is false, and run it again. That doesn't show up because A isn't false. A is true. What if I was to flip this, though, to false? Now, it says A is false because A is false. All right, now let's move on to the else statement, which is basically in addition to the if statement. So when we ask the true or false question, like we did with the if statement, we only had code run if the answer was true. What if we want some code to run only if the answer is false? We can do this with the if statement, or sorry, with the else statement. Let's consider a chicken crossing the road <laughs> again. If it has successfully crossed the road, then we congratulate it. So if the answer to have you cross the road is true, we, we say congratulations. Now we can also add a second part. Else, as in like, if not, if you haven't crossed the road, then we'll motivate you. And so it's, the second part is asking, is saying if the answer to the if question is false, then we do this other set of code, which is motivating the chicken to cross the road. <laughs> now let's look at syntax. So. Like, just like we had the if with the condition or question and the code for the if statement, we have the else as if with, an, with the else keyword at the same level as the if, no indentation. And then we put a colon. Then you go to the next line and you should have an indentation to write out your code. If it's not tabbed to the right, you'll want to do that, but most editors normally tab it to the right already. If you just hit enter. So now let's replace our second question in that earlier code with the else statement. So instead of writing out this whole if thing, we can just say else. So now it's going to say if a is true, print this. If it's not, if a is not true, which means a has to be false because booleans can only be two values, right? True or false. So if it's not true, it has to be false. So if a is not true, then you print a is false. You don't have to write out the whole second if question. And also, yeah, so basically you have two choices. 
So if I made this false, it still says A is false. If I changed it back to true, it should say A is true. Yep. So it still works just as it did earlier. All we did was replace the condition with the else question or else statement keyword. The thing about if and else is that one of the two statements will always run. The code will choose which one runs based on the answer to the question we ask at the if statement. Here we're basically asking if, is A true? But again, like I said earlier, we're doing a shortcut. And if it is true and the answer is yes, then it'll run this. If the answer is no, it'll go back to run this. Um, this is supposed to be a hands-on class where you, you can pull up the um, editor that we're working on. You can get it at stempump.com slash r slash editor. Now let's move on to a version of the L statement or if statement whatever it is, but like combined. So this is called the elif. The elif is basically an else if. So it, it's it's when we first ask the question with the if, and if, if, it's, if the answer comes out to be false and we want to ask a second question, we use this. For example, we could say, if the chicken crossed the road, congratulate it, like earlier, Else, if the chicken is halfway there, say you're almost there, right? Because now you're saying else if or elif. So we have a second condition. So if he didn't reach the end, maybe he's halfway there. If he is halfway there, then we'll, mot then we'll tell him you're almost there to motivate him. And if he hasn't started, then we'll end with the else, which is, okay, he hasn't even gotten halfway. We have to motivate him or her. I don't know. It's a chicken. It. Yeah, and then as usual, we always end with an else as default. So let's look at the syntax. It's basically the if statement syntax, except with an elif. So we, ought, we put another question in after the if and run another set of code. And then we have the else, which is kind of like a default, I guess, because if it doesn't meet the if condition or the elif condition, we go to the else. Let's work with the same old example. But this time, let's let's go back to the Donald example. Sorry. So maybe I can get it. No, probably not. Okay. So let's go name equals Marie again. And then if name is Donald, print hi Donald like last time. Elif, now this is where it comes in. Sorry, we have to go back, right? We have to be in the same level as the if when we write this elif. Now we're going to check. Okay, if it's not Donald, then it'll, if, if the if it name isn't Donald, it'll go down to the elif and check this condition. And so if it isn't Donald and it is Marie, we could say, hi, Marie. And if it's none of those, I guess you could say you're not Donald or Marie because this person is not either because the name isn't Donald or Marie. So how this would work, let's say this wasn't Marie, maybe Aaron and run. You're not Donald or Marie. That's because first it checks the if. Is Aaron equal to Donald? Well, no, so it doesn't do this. Now it goes to the next one. Is Aaron equal to Marie? Again, no, so it doesn't do this. Lastly, okay, if it's none of those, we have to go to this. So it just runs this statement, which prints out, you're not Donald or Marie. Any questions so far? Now, what if we put change the name to Marie? Ideally, it would say, hi, Marie. So let's see. 
and it does. So that works. All right, now let's move on to loops. In programming, we use loops to run a set of instructions over and over again. We can have loops run a certain number of times, and that's called a for loop. We can also have loops just keep running until a condition is met. What I mean by condition is, again, just the same old true or false question. If the answer is yes, it'll keep running. But the moment the answer becomes no, It'll stop running. So with the and this is called a while loop, and we'll work with these right now. With while loops, you, you just put some code inside the loop and keep asking the same question. Every time the code in the loop runs, the true or false question is asked to the program. If the answer is ever false, the loop will stop running. And so the, the, the syntax of the while loop looks like this. You start with the while keyword, followed by the true or false question, also called a condition. If the answer is true, we run this code. And then we come back to ask to come back up here again, and then ask if it's true again. If it's still true, we run this code again. But at some point in time, if this ever becomes if the answer to this is ever false, this stops running. Let's use this in the editor. Let's do like a hide and seek kind of game, like where you just kind of count, you know, the counter, like when you go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, all the way up to 10. And then you say here, here, or ready or not, here I come. Let's do that. So let's make a counter. Um, we'll start by importing time. This is just us importing a library from Python that allows us to work with time. You don't need to worry about it that much. Um, just know that we'll have to use this for one particular um, piece of code. It's not that important. Now, and normally you always put your imports at the top. So just know that. Let's create a variable named number. Um, or I guess we could call it count and set it equal to one. This is basically the time, like the second we're on. So we could say one Mississippi then the number the count becomes two, and then we go two Mississippi, and so on. So let's do that. Let's start with a while loop now. Um, we write the while keyword, followed by the condition or the question. The question I'm going to ask is, is count less than 10? If it is less than 10, we can run the code inside the loop. But the moment it becomes equal to 10 or greater than 10, we stop running the code inside this loop. So now notice that I'm indented when I'm when I hit enter after the colon. All your code in the loop also has to be indented just like in an if statement. Let's write the code that goes inside the loop. So since we want to count, let's first display that we're counting. We'll print out the number we're at followed by Mississippi because I guess some people still do that. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, etc. So let's do that. Um, what I'm going to need to do is first of all, I'm going to need to print, of course. Inside that, I'm going to have to do str count. What this does is basically, con so since count is a number, right, and we're trying to print it, we can only print out strings. So to make count, which is a number, into a string, the string of count would just look like it in quotes. So now it's a string. See the color changed? Now you can't add like one, two, three, etc. It wouldn't like go up to two or three if you were to add numbers to it. So this is why we don't use it as a string. We keep it as a number. But when we're printing it out, we need it to be a string. Therefore, we use the Python name for the str for a string or reference name for strings, which is str, followed by parentheses and the name of the variable. This this whole thing is basically taking the string form of count, which in first the first time around it would be quote one quote. And then we want to add space Mississippi because like that's how you count I guess. 
I think I spelled that right. I'm very scared about that. Okay. So, um, yeah, we print that out. And then, since we want the number to increase every time we run this loop, we're going to do count equals count plus one. So now we're adding one to count because we have the initial or the old count and we add one. There's actually a shortcut for this, which is just plus equal to. So we're adding one to the current value of count. So if count was one, after the first time this loops runs, count becomes two. And then we come back. If count is two, two is still less than 10. So this code will still run. It'll print out two Mississippi, then count will become three and so on. But since we want this to last one second each time we count, this is where that time comes in. So we have to do time.sleep1. You don't need to know exactly what this does, what exactly what this does, just know that what I'm, this line of code makes the makes the program wait one second before putting the next or before continuing. So every time we go through this loop, we wait one second before going back to the top and asking the question again. Now let's run this code. Uh, and it should count from one to 10. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi. And it does it once in one second intervals. Awesome. And at the end, I guess, I guess we'd say less than or equal to 10 because we want it to reach 10, right? So let's run that again. Awesome. So now that we have this while loop in place and it's time, the time has worked, if we want, we can also add a final ready or not here I come statement. Since we don't want the ready or not statement um, to keep um, being printed every time we count, we only want it to do it at the end, we get rid of the indent and type it outside of the loop essentially because we're indented out of it. We're no longer indented right, we're at the extreme left. And here we can say, ready or not, here I come. And so, and so this should work. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, and so on. And then at the end, you hit ready or not, here I come. Pretty neat. And so we just created a sort of interesting program and now we'll go into something even cooler. Awesome. So next up we have the input statement. The input statement is used to get input from the person running the program on the computer. Just like we just ran the program in the console, the print statement, the input statement lets the user actually input information to the program by typing. It can be used the at to ask the user a question and store its answer in a variable. We typically follow this syntax. Um, we start with the variable we want to store the answer in. So in this case, I guess we'll put it, we'll do name. Then we write out input parentheses. And inside that in quotes, we write the question we want to ask. And so since we're, I guess we want the name, we'll ask what's your name. And then the, whatever the user answers will be stored in the name variable. Same thing for age. We could say age, enter your age. Whatever the user enters will be put in to the age variable. To see what this looks like, we'll be working on a mini project. So let's get to that. Let's, let's now use our knowledge of loops and if statements and everything to create a pin system like the ones on most smartphones. We'll ask the user for the pin and we'll give them three tries to get it right. If they don't, we'll post a message saying they failed to unlock the phone. If they were successful, we'll tell them they wish they successfully logged in. So let's get to that. Um, let's start off by creating a variable to hold the number of attempts the user has tried.
Um, so let's start with making a variable named attempts and set it equal to zero because right now the user hasn't had any failed attempts. Let's make a correct pin variable to hold the correct pin. This is really just for like making it more descriptive and clear so that you know it's easier to read because now you know, okay, we're, we're dealing with the correct pin here. That's what the number means. I'm going to set it equal to 1056 or, you know, let's just do one, two, three, four. Um, so this way it's easier to use and we don't have to remember the correct pin whenever we want to use it in the code. Also, if we ever want to change the correct pin used in the program, we only need to change it here. We don't need to change it everywhere we use this variable because the variable is there for a reason. Now let's move on to the actual logic. Let's create a while loop that runs as long as the user hasn't used up their three attempts. So in the loop, each time the user gets it wrong, we'll add one to the attempts variable. That way the loop can only run a max of three times and we just need to check the value of the attempts variable. We'll see, we'll ask, is the attempts variable Okay, just a sec. So back to where I was earlier. Temps equals zero. Correct pin is one, two, three, four. Um, and now we're going to check is the number of attempts tried less than three? If so, he can try again. And inside the inside the while loop, we'll let him try again. So now we'll get the pin that he entered. He enters, so or he or she enters. So we'll add, we'll put an enter we'll put an input, and say enter the pin. So basically, what's happening here is we have a variable named entered pin, which will take in this value that the user user enters over here. And this value is always a string because whatever the user enters is accepted as a string. We can always change this obviously using int or f or float or whatever we want, like like I did with str earlier. But let's not get into that. Um, now it's time to check if the entered pin was correct. So let's do the logic for that. If the entered pin is the same as the correct pin, which I'm doing using the two double equal sign like earlier, then we can say you've said you successfully logged in. Because he was right. And then there's a new there's a new um, statement that we're gonna use. It's called the break. What this does is it forcefully leaves the loop. So now the next piece of code will happen here next code the program will run. It'll skip everything inside the loop and stop running their loop over and over again. It just goes out. But that's only if it was correctly, because if it's entered correctly, we don't want to keep asking him to enter the pin. We'll only ask it that one time and then he's entered correctly, so we leave. But what if he didn't? This is where we have to use the else, because if he didn't get it right, he had to have got it wrong, right? And then if he got it wrong, we can say print incorrect try again and we'll add one to the attempts variable because we don't want him to have infinite tries so we have to add one every time if he gets it wrong remember what i said earlier yeah so now if we were to run this code it would give him three chances but we want it, we want to show a final failure message if he uses up all three attempts if he, if he uses up all three attempts and the attempts variable is equal to three because he used up all three, three attempts, we will still need to tell the user he's been locked out or something. We know that the loop will reset attempts to three if the user got all three attempts wrong. So if the variable is greater than or equal to three, we'll show the error message after the loop. So if attempts is greater than or equal to three, then we can show an error message like Oops, seems like you've forgotten your pin or something. And then let's run this code. So um, I guess we could try one, 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 two, 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 one, two, three, four. Correct. 
Now, if you want to see the failure message, one, two, 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 one, two, 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 one, two, four, five. Oops, it seems like you've forgotten your pin. So basically our pin system seems to work very well. Um, another way Python can help you. Just let, let's keep going then, shall we? Let's move on and make sure your indenting's right. Okay, we don't want to mess that up. That could be a main reason why your program isn't working like mine is. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now let's go to the next order of business, which is lists. In programming languages, lists allow for organization. They let you store multiple values in one structure. These values could be strings, booleans, integers, floats, any data type, and any assortment of them. As seen in the list over here, I've put multiple types of data, a string, an integer, and a float. And I also sort of numbered them, but like that's not really matter. That doesn't really matter, like one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is just to show you, you can show numbers in any form. Um, and lists are useful to store information in a program while it's running. Each item in a list gets an index number, and this is the number we use to access it, like the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Like an ordered list, there are numbers that each list item is assigned to, right? So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Even, and it starts from zero because that's just how programming works. Index numbers begin from zero and increase by one as you move to the right. You won't see them explicitly, but you just have to know, okay, first element is zero, second element is one, third element is two, three, four, five, and so on. Um, index numbers are kind of like giving park ex parking spots in a parking lot specific numbers. The entire list can be thought of as a parking lot and each, and each spot on the list is a parking spot. Each spot has its own number, just like each um, item on this list has its own index number. And we can use the number of the parking lot to find the parked car, just like we can use the index number to find the value of the item. That must have been a lot to take in, so if you have any questions, now would be a good time to ask. So now let's let's just create a list so you know what it looks looks actually no let's go to let's access let's look let's talk about how you access the values in a list first because I said you can use the index number to access the list or values in a list so let's go to that we can access specific list items using their index number like I said earlier 0 1 2 3 4 5 um now what do I mean by access I mean that we can get the value of whatever is in that spot on the list. We can set a variable to equal this value. We can check the value of this in an if statement and anything else you want. It's basically just using it or checking it, referencing it. That's what I mean by access. Let's work on an example here, but basically to access, you have to type out the name of the list followed by square brackets and the index number of the list. To actually create a list, you just have to you have to type out the name of the list, and, and, like an assignment operator. It's basically you're, you're assigning the list to a variable, and then you just have square brackets for the list. Each item in the list is separated by a comma. That's how lists work in Python. Several other languages are pretty similar in syntax. So if you know Java, I think it's pretty similar. And then, again, to access the list item, you type the name of the list square brackets, no space between the name and the brackets, and then inside the brackets, you type the index number in. So for my list, like we had here, index number three is this this text for string. So if I for, so the name of the list is my list, the index number is three, and the value of that is text four. Let's work on an example dealing with the colors of rainbows. 
So we'll make a list, rainbow colors. Again, underscore because you can't have spaces in the, in the name. And then what are the colors in the rainbow? It's like or red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and indigo. Oh, sorry, and violet. Oops. So there's like seven, the seven main colors in a rainbow. And so this is our list right now. If we want, we can print out the whole list to see what it looks like, but it's just going to look the same. It's going to look exactly the same. Yeah, see? Now, like I said, we can access each item in the list by using the index number. Let's do that. Let's access the first number, in, the first item in the list. So rainbow colors and then square brackets. And we'll use an index of zero because that's the first item on the list. Run it. And you get red because the first item on the list is red. What if we wanted, say, the fourth item on the list? That would be the name of the list, which is rainbow colors. And then three because index of three is four. This is the fourth item. And so we get green because the fourth item is green. Pretty neat. That's the basics behind lists. So that's pretty much the basics of Python there. And we're going to go into more complex stuff now. So if you have any questions or want me to go back to something, now would be a good time to ask. Um, which code is it that you want me to show? So if you wanted me to put in the pin uh, code, I'm doing that right now. And you can take a look. Then, like I said, at the end, if attempts is greater than or equal to three, print, oops, seems like you've forgotten your pin. Any other questions? Um, I'll just create a new file, I guess, for the rest of this. And if you ever need to go back, just keep that. Okay, cool. So, uh, let's move on to the more advanced topics behind lists and, um, list methods. So what are list methods? When we work at lists, besides creating and accessing items, 
You might want to want modify the list by adding items or removing items. There are two basic list methods we'll go over to do that. Um, there's the dot append method, which as expected, adds an item to the end of the list. You put the item inside the parentheses and it'll be added. Similarly, dot remove removes the item from the list. So if you put the item, like the value in parentheses, in the parentheses, it'll be removed from the list. Let's go back to the rainbow example and do this. So rainbow colors. And now let's append two rainbow colors, the sky variable, sorry, the sky item. Um, because you know, at the end of the rainbow, after the colors, you, you see the sky, so why not? Let's add it and then let's print out the entire um, list. So now you see that there's also a sky item added to the list. Now let's also remove this item and see what happens. Or let's remove another color. Let's remove the first one, which is red. And now let's print out the whole list again. Let's see what happens. So now, Although we did add sky earlier, we lost red when we printed out the second time because I removed red using this list method. We'll go over more like about what methods are and functions later, um, but just know that that's basically what the list methods do. They allow you to do more advanced stuff and we're gonna have to use this in an upcoming project. Next, let's go on to for loops that we can use on lists. So, we can loop through the items of a list using the for loop. This means we can run some code repetitively on each item of the list. For example, printing each item in a list out in order. You do this using the for in syntax. You type for, followed by a name you want to give to refer to each item on the list, and then in, and then the name of the list. Then again, you indent and write the code. When I say indent, I mean, if it confuses you guys, basically, if you hit enter after the colon, it should automatically move one tab to the right. If not, just tab to the right um, F to get to the indented space. Now, um, you end with the colon, of course, and then you type the actual code, write whatever you want, and make sure to refer to each item by this name that you decided to refer to each item as because there's no specific name variable so this is basically a variable that's created to refer to each item i'll show we'll go over an example with the rainbows so if we want to loop through each color in the rainbow i guess i could give a name for each since each item in this rainbow is actually a color i guess we'll name it color so for, for color in rainbow colors, um, print um, yeah, we could say that this color is part of the rainbow. So color is part of the rainbow. And, and so what this is going to do is it's going to take the color for each item in rainbow colors. Oops, spelled that wrong. So we could take red for the first first time around this loop, it'll plug in red for color. Second time around, it'll plug in orange for color. Third time around, it'll plug in yellow for color. Fourth time, green, and so on. Up to blue, all the way up to violet. And then sky, because we added sky. So let's see what that looks like. Orange is a part of the rainbow, yellow is a part of the rainbow, green is a part of the rainbow, and so on. So any questions about the for loop?
You want? All right, so let's move on to a project that works with a shopping list because I think it's better to work on projects because it'll help us understand what's going on better. So if you're ready, I think it's time for us to move on to that. So let's create, let's work on another mini project. This time we'll work on a shopping list. Like I said, we'll make a shopping list program that runs over and over again and accepts three commands, add, delete, and print. Add lets you add an item, delete lets you delete an item, and print lets you see the whole list. We'll be using these concepts in this project. So let's do that right now. Let's first create a shopping list list. And then let's, this will hold all the items in the shopping list. Now let's start with a loop that is basically like those forever loops in Scratch because I'm going to say while true. This means that this everything in this loop is going to run repetitively forever until the program stopped. Um, because true we're, is always true. It's always yes. It's never going to be no until we like break. So it's just going to keep running this everything in this loop over and over again, which is what we want to do because we want to keep accepting commands from whoever is using the shopping list app. So now let's start off by making some space in the console by printing out a simple space. This way it'll be easier to read. Now let's accept a command from the user by input by taking in an input again, setting it equal to the variable user command. And this time I will ask the question or enter the command, I guess, is what we could tell the user to do. And after we have this command, we want to check. Let's first create what, what would happen if yeah, so uh, sorry, I was reading your issues and stuff. So user item, enter command. And what we want to do is first work on the add functionality. So we want to work on what happens when we use the add command. So if user command equals add, then we want whatever, then we write whatever code we want to run if he chose to add, which in this case is letting him pick an item to add and then adding, actually adding that to the list and telling him that we added that. So first let's let him pick the item to add. So we'll make another variable named item and then input item colon space. And so now it's going to ask and it's going to ask him to enter the item and he'll type it out and it'll be stored in the item variable. And then because we want to add it to the list, let's use that list method now. So shopping list dot append item. So what happens is whatever item he told us to add will be added to this list shopping list. Lastly, let's give him a confirmation mess or him or her a confirmation message to say that it was successfully added. So we can say item, whatever item it was that he wanted us to add was successfully added. Let's test this out now. So run it. See, I made a mistake here because I need two equals. The single equal to sign is an assignment operator double equal sign is what we use to check for equality. All right, so let's enter a command. I'll do add again, and I'll add an item. Um, I don't know, popcorn? Popcorn was successfully added, so that works. Now let's do the delete a method or functionality thing, command. So if, if it's equal to delete, then we want him to pick the item again. So we'll do the same thing as last time. Mm -hmm. 
but at the same but this time we'll remove that item instead of adding it so we'll do dot remove instead of dot add and it'll remove that item from the list if it's in it and then another confirmation message item was successfully removed and so that's that we can try this now and say okay let's add pop or sorry add then the item will add is popcorn then let's do delete item will delete is popcorn and popcorn was removed obviously we can't really see the list right now so we have to add that last command which is print which will allow us to see the list and therefore actually see what's going on so we'll do if the user command is print then we will have to loop through the items of the list using that for loop I was talking about earlier. So I'm going to have to first make it look nice. So I'm going to say or write a heading, which is shopping list colon, just for like just to make it look nice. And then I'm going to have to create a counter variable. I'm going to use this counter variable to make an ordered list. So every item on the list is given. So we start with one, the second item becomes two and three and so on. So we'll see a number one, then the item name, number two, item name, number three, item name, and so on. So let's actually work on that so you actually know what I'm talking about. So I printed out shopping list. Now I'll make a for loop to loop through each item on the list and print each item out. So for, what do you want to call each item on the list? Let's call it food item. I don't know, you can call it whatever you want. Um, in the shopping list, I guess we're going grocery shopping then. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll do an underscore here. For the for each food item in the shopping list, we want to print out the. You know what? Let's get rid of this counter because that might be a bit confusing. Let's just print out the food item. Oh, that was shopping list instead of shopping list. Yikes. Okay, so now we print out the list item. And let's see this in action. This should be our shopping list in action. So let's enter a command. Let's do add popcorn. Now let's print the list. And we see there's popcorn on the list. Now let's add something else. Hmm. Ice cream? I guess everyone likes ice cream. Most people like ice cream. And then, so ice cream was also added. Now if we print the list again, ice cream's also on it. Now let's delete something. We'll delete popcorn, I guess. And so now, if we look at the list again, by hitting print, there's only ice cream on this list. So yeah, like I said, this, this is a really cool shopping list app. Any questions before we move on? I'll wait uh, for you guys to catch up. If you have any questions, I'll answer them. Thanks for the comment. Yeah, it is pretty cool, isn't it? So let's go back to talking about what I was doing here. Basically, we start off with the shopping list uh, list. It's empty initially, therefore there's no items inside. Then we start a forever loop. If you're familiar with Scratch, that's what's going on here. The loop just keeps looping over and over again until we forcefully stop it, which we don't do here. We can use the stop button on the top of the screen to stop it. Um, yeah, so, and then we accept a command from the user and store that in the user command, 
like I said, we're, except, we're expecting one of three, add, delete, or print. And so here, here we accept add, delete, or print. And if you don't get either of that, you'll see an error message, which is when we, we could try to fix that. But for now, let's just focus on this. Or you know what? Let's, let's fix that. Let's do, why are we using if when we can use elif? right? And then let's end with a default option, which is else in case it was neither of those. And we could say, I didn't understand what you said. So if the command isn't either of the things that was said, or that it wasn't add, delete, or print, we can have this error message show up. And it would be like try again. And let's let's actually try that. So I'll, I'll stop it and then I'll run it again. And this time, we'll, I don't know. Let's say remove. It said I didn't understand what you said. Try again. That's right because we said we can only accept add, delete, and print. And so it's not going to understand what we meant by remove because we never checked for remove. Again, if it was a human being, it would have figured that out. But since these are not humans, but computers, we have to code that in. I'm sorry, these are computers, not human beings. We have to code that in. Yeah. Um, so now we can go back and just try again. Popcorn, add ice cream, add cereal, and then print. And you have three items on your list. Anyone else with questions, or are we ready to move on? Okay. I guess we'll move on then. So, um, next up, we're pretty much um, done with all the projects we're going to work on for today, but let's still move on to some more complex topics. First of all, like we discussed lists, like a shopping list, let's move on to dictionaries. In Python, we have Dictionaries, which are another data structure that we can use. It's a, another form of data structure, uh, sorry, data storage um, that allows us to store values using key value pairs. It's essentially like a real dictionary where the key is like the, the word and the value is the definition of the word. So we have to know what the word is to find its definition, right? So we go in a dictionary and we go looking for the word and then we find the definition. That's what we do here. So we have a dictionary with the key on the left and then the value. So we go into the dictionary looking at looking for the key. So if we want to look for the age, we'd go through this dictionary and we'd be like, oh, age, and the value is 16. That's the whole concept behind dictionaries. Instead of storing it with no index numbers like you have in lists, it's arranged using key value pairs. So we have a key. A key is just a word used to describe this uh, the left-hand side. A description, I guess, for the, what the value. Um, and we store dictionaries just like lists in a variable. I don't think you, you probably should you shouldn't capitalize it. So ignore this. Capitalizing is not a good practice for variable naming. It's like not part of the naming um, struct or way we do it. Um, but yeah, and so you write the you know, name of the variable or, that you want to assign the dictionary to, and you put an equal sign followed by a curly brace. Instead of the lists, which use square brackets, we use the curly brace here. Then we do the name of the key. We do the key in quotes. The key always has to actually, no, you have the key on the left side, and then colon, the value on the right side. And then there's a comma to go down to the next key value pair. It's a pair because you have a key and a value, two things, key value, pair. And you could be, you could have an either type, or you could have a string value, an integer value, anything. Here we have a dictionary that has information about a person, specifically his name and age. Um, so, yeah, let's also move on now to functions. Dictionaries, you can, you'll find them used very often with Python. 
but it's a very Python specific concept. It's not in languages like Java. So keep that in mind. Now let's move on to functions. So functions are used to bundle a set of instructions together that you want to use repeatedly in your code. They are basically blocks of code that you create or in a technical term, define, and they only run when you call on them using a particular statement. First, to make a function, you have to use the DEF keyword. It's, it's the short form for define, and basically you're defining the function or, or making it. So you write the DEF keyword, followed by the name of the function, and then parentheses. These parentheses might remind you of something, and we'll get into that later. And then you have the colons again and then you hit enter and you should come up here with an end we should be tabbed to the right one if you haven't do it yourself manually it should automatically happen most of the time and so yeah and that's to make the function so now that you've made the function you've written the instructions inside the function with the tab to the right you might you'd have to you to actually make that stuff run you'd have to call on the function. And to do so, you have to write out the, the name of the function again. But this time, you don't write DEF. You just write the name of the function and then the parentheses, nothing else. So let's, let's work on an example to make a quick function that will offer a greeting. Um, this is our shopping list code. I think someone had an issue with that. If you want, I, I'd suggest just pausing here to take a look. Um, and so now let's move on. So to actually make a function, let's let's create the greeting function, like I said, to offer a formal greeting. So greeting. And so we did def name of the function parentheses, and then a colon. Cool. And then I hit enter, next line with the indent, and I'll print good afternoon. So this is me greeting someone. And so if I was to run this code, nothing happened. Why? Because all I did was create the bundle of instructions. I never ran the bundle of instructions. To actually run that bundle of instructions, you have to write out the function name again, followed by the parentheses. And now it'll do it. And now instead of copying this code, I can just write greeting over and over again if I wanted to keep doing it. But this is not where the power of functions lies. The power of functions lies in the option to do arguments, which I'll get into next. So arguments are basically the inputs you can feed into a function. These inputs are also known as parameters, and the names are pretty interchangeable. There's like some technicality behind it. You don't need to know about that. Anyway, in Python, to accept inputs to a function, you have to define the arguments when you make the function. We do this by writing names we want to give each argument in the parentheses. So if I want to accept two arguments, I'd name, and I created a function named connect text, text. <laughs> I'd taken two arguments, one named text one, the other named text two. And since I want to connect them, I'll give back text one plus a space plus text two. Cause like, you know how I said you need the space and it's like weird otherwise, cause like they'll be, see, they'll look like they're attached. So yeah, that's how that works. So you print, that's, we're printing a combination of three strings here using concatenation. But what the real thing that's going on here is I've created a bundle of instructions again. Really, it's just one instruction, but we'll get into more complex functions in our soon. And, and so here what we do is we just say talk there. I don't know why that says talk, it should say connect text. Anyway, that's, that's a typo. Um, but yeah, you say hi comma there and it'll, it'll attach hi there together and print it out with a space, although there's a space here too. So that's kind of messed up. Anyway, let's um, do, let's apply this to the greeting function. Now let's accept a name 
so that we can personalize the function for different people. We could say, good afternoon, and then put the name in between. Obviously, you need that space there. Um, that's really important, otherwise it looks weird. Anyway, so you need that greeting. And now, so we've created a function that accepts a parameter, but how do you pass the parameter in? You go back here and notice how I plugged in two inputs. I plugged in hi and there. What's going on here is we're, we're passing in two inputs. So each, each thing we put inside the parentheses matches directly up to what we put inside the parentheses here. So hi becomes text one and there becomes text two. So hi, it'll print out hi as text one plus a space plus there is text two all together. So it'll say hi there. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to say greeting to maybe someone named Aaron. And then, but the cool thing about this is now instead of writing this out with a different name each time, I can just put the greeting function into different names. So I could do George, Rahul, and so on. And then I'll run. And see, it does, it gives me personalized um, print statements for each person. That's the beauty of functions there, because now you can do it for different people just by changing one word. But that too, in a really simple way that doesn't look ugly. So yeah, you get the concept there, I hope. So we could do something like Jordan or Eleanor, actually, Maybe not. Okay, so run. And there you go. That's pretty much all of the basics we'll cover today in terms of coding. So I'll just let you guys figure that out. If you have any questions, do ask about functions. We can make this more complex if necessary and be like um, print or another thing we can do is instead of printing this out, we can use the return keyword. The return keyword is like a special keyword that can be used um, instead of a print statement, I guess, to give you a value back instead of printing it to the console. So let, let me clear this up. So we'll do greeting again. Or no, let's make a some addition and we'll take in addition and we'll take in two numbers um, num1 and num2 and here instead of printing out the answer I'll return it so I'll make a variable called total set it equal to num1 plus num2 and then I'll return that total so what do I mean by return? Notice how it's highlighted. That means that so that means that it's a keyword, right? Just like the df and from earlier the if, while, etc. So it's a special word reserved in Python, and what it does is it gives back the value to you instead of printing it. What I mean by that is we can actually set this the answer to a variable of value. We kind of have to do that actually. So for example, I could say my total, a new variable I just made would equal the addition of the numbers five and seven. And what this is doing, it, it, it gives me, it returns the value five and seven. And this whole expression is just 12 because five plus seven is 12 and that's what's returned. So I get a 12 back. So if I was to print my total, or just pr yeah, print my total, I'd get this. So now I can't just write this out on its own. It has to be set equal to a variable because now it's returning the value instead of printing it. And then I can print the variable value. So I'd be running it and I get 12.
this return keyword is used a lot more often because most of the time you don't have a console to print to and you just want to use this in your code. Like even in robotics, I'm pretty sure in FTC, you'd use re the return keyword um, a lot for most of your functions. So yeah. And also just to clear up something, a lot of, t like I said, list methods, methods and functions are pretty much the same thing. It's just an interchangeable word. There's that, we go into what the actual difference is into in, in on our website. So if you want to go to our resources page, you can learn about that. Anyway, now let's move on. Since we've covered all the basics and all the coding we're going to do today, let's go back and talk about the input and print and all that stuff that I said we'd put on for later. Because now I think we understand how all this works. So, did you know that all the statements we've used with the parentheses were actually functions? The input was a function, print was a function, and append and remove, remove were also functions. All of these functions came pre-built with Python. Even that sleep was a function. They come, they come with Python, so we don't have to like write it out. They, they come with, they come pre-built with the Python library. I'll talk about what libraries are in a second, but they come pre-built, so we just need to write out the function, and it'll do all that stuff for us. Um, now, if you're interested in seeing a sample project on Python that uh, that one that we've made at Stempump, um, we built a sample Hangman project for you to play around with. There's comments all over it so you can understand how it works. You can download the project from stempump.com slash r slash sample. If you have Python on your, on your computer, you can run it like that. Or you can just copy all the text and plug it into the editor we're working on with today. So yeah, and then you can read through the file, read the comments, understand what's going on. It just shows the complexity that Python can get to to make really cool games. And this is really just a basic game. There's way cooler games that are made with like Python and other programming languages. So yeah, feel free to check it out. That's stempump.com slash r slash sample. I'll pull it up for a sec so you can check it out. So uh, I have it open with me. Let's go back to this editor and plug it in and now run. So this is basically a hangman game. If you want, you can try. I guess if you wanted to play hang, I, I, I built it with Python and there's comments all over it that to help you understand how it works. Comments are really just lines with hashtag or pound sign, whatever you want to call it in front so that the code, the code compiler doesn't read it. It doesn't run anything with a hash or a hash sign in front. It's just for you to read and better understand the code. So I guess if we were to play Hangman, you'd always start with the vowels. So let's go A, E, I, O, maybe U? Nope. Okay. C, K. Anyone have any ideas? I don't know. R? No, I already did that. A. Oops, did that. P. T. Q. <laughs> nope, game over. It was Sherlock Holmes. Okay, cool. So, that's just one one fun game that you can do with Python. Um, so yeah, feel free to check it out. Now let's go to the next thing. So how do you use Python in the real world? 
Um, so to repeat what we just did, like with all of that programming in the online editor, all you have to do is go to python.org, download the latest py version of Python, and then find a good IDE that you like, download that, and you can write all these programs in your IDE and then run them in the terminal or command prompt. You can find tutorials on how to do this on our website or online. So yeah, feel free to check that out. Okay, and then next we have applications of Python. So the cool thing about Python is it's used in a lot of different ways. It's, it's used in, it's really popular and has many frameworks and libraries that make programming in it a lot easier and faster. And so I, I just said framework and library, right? So let me clear up what that means. A framework is essentially a pre-built template of software, software as in like programmed code that you can modify as you need, like to fit certain needs. Like most of it's already done for you. All the generic stuff's done. You only have to change like specific stuff. And a library is just a collection of pre-built functions, like how function gave us some pre-built, uh, sorry, how Python gave us some pre-built functions like input and print. You can also access other libraries that give you other pre-written functions where all you have to do is type out the function name and it'll do everything for you. So that's how libraries and frameworks work. And let's consider these examples here. So Python is actually used a lot with web development these days. You can use frameworks like Django or Flask uh, for this purpose. They basically create all the generic functionality of a website and all you have to do is customize it to fit your needs. So basically like all of like how a website normally works, like the linking and everything is done for you. All you have to do is like specify how the website should look and um, like which, which pages should link to where. The rest is like all done already for you. So it's really, it's really convenient that way. Other cool things that Python has is software packages that you can use for stuff like scientific research. Several people have built really cool software packages that come that are built in Python and can be used in Python. Um, one such example is Eon. Eon is stands for Epidemics on Networks, and it's a package that you can use to model and analyze how epidemics, like the current coronavirus outbreak, spread uh, across like different networks, like transportation networks. It, it's really cool and um, it's a great opportunity for like some intensive research. And then. Something that you guys probably don't like or aren't interested in as much is Python's used a lot with database and network programming. But I guess, like, like I said, you're probably not interested in that. So let's gloss over that. Another cool thing it's used for is game development. You can you can get started with game development by taking our RPG Maker course. We have resources online and a camp coming. So yeah, feel free to learn about that. It'll get you up to speed on how game development works. And you can make proper video games. Lastly, one of my personal favorites in Python of, of, use, of the usage of Python is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Thanks to libraries like TensorFlow, we can now use Python to develop machines with artificial intelligence. These machines can do stuff like read text, like actually convert written text on a piece of paper to text on like a computer. And then it can also understand spoken English. Self-driving cars come from this. Uh, like self-drive, self-flying planes, everything. Really, it's really, really interesting. And so, anyone have any questions? Okay, there is no second part to this. This is the only Python um, that we're doing. However, we do have the resources on our website, python.com, so uh, stemflip.com, um, and you can, you can find the rest, the more advanced concepts of Python there. Um, we didn't want to go over that today because I didn't want to rush you. It was already a bit rushed and going over too much wouldn't have been good, for, good that good. Anyway, um, so yeah, okay, cool. So 
Uh, if you want to learn more or didn't finish, you can always go to stempum.com slash r slash python. And if not, or if you want to watch, rewatch this, we'll have this posted on YouTube and Twitch soon after this camp's over. And so we've just completed the Stempum course. We had the web design course done a couple days ago. And if you're interested in any of these other courses coming up, feel free to sign up. Like I said, artificial intelligence is pretty interesting. You might want to go do that. If not, there's Java, another programming language you might use for FTC. There's FTC judging if any of you are in FTC and so on. And so if you want to sign up for more camps, please sign up at stempub.com slash camps. And download our app from the App Store if you want to um, access our resources on an app or you want to watch all the video, all the um, camp recordings and, or sign up for camps. Yeah, like I said, you can find the video of this camp on our YouTube channel, stempub.com slash rssyt. And add us on social media, uh, Discord, Instagram, and Twitter. If you have any questions that you don't have answered yet feel free to reach out to us in uh, either of these means we'll be happy to answer your questions and please we appreciate your feedback so please um offer your feedback thank you and thanks for joining the stream have a good thursday